Welcome to this webinar entitled Rare Thrombotic Response to a SARS-CoV-2 Vaccine. Our moderator is Mr. George A. Fritzma. And now let's get started with the webinar. Mr. Fritzma holds a master's in medical laboratory science from Wayne State University and advanced coursework from the University of Illinois at Chicago. He consults for the laboratory medicine division of the University of Alabama Hospital and is a contributing author for Rodax Hematology published in 2020. George is a scientific advisor for Biomedica Diagnostics Inc. And he manages the Fritzma Factor, your interactive hemostasis resource at fritzmafactor.com. He'll be sharing his own insights and that of his expert guests to help you better understand the connection between thrombosis and thrombocytopenia that have been associated with viral vector vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. Now I'll pass it on to Mr. Fritzma. Thank you, Rose, for that introduction. When the adenoviral associated vector vaccines encoding the spike protein antigen of SARS-CoV-2 were made available in early 2021, a small number of unusual thrombotic events developed in association with thrombocytopenia. Reviewers found that this type of vaccine can result in the rare development of immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia mediated by platelet-activating antibodies against platelet factor four without exposure to heparin. This condition mimics heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, often called HIT. This presentation will discuss the mechanisms for thrombus formation and thrombocytopenia, the laboratory testing to establish the diagnosis, and the recommended treatment. Dr. Laposada will give his presentation with a dialogue between himself and me, and the speakers, will, we will respond at the end to five opinion poll questions and wrap up with an opportunity for participants to ask questions through the Q&A box. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Michael Laposada, Professor and Chair, Department of Pathology, University of Texas Medical Branch, Galveston, Texas. Dr. Laposada received his MD and PhD degrees from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He also served at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, Mass General Hospital with Harvard, Harvard Medical School, and Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Dr. Laposada has won 15 major teaching prizes, and in 2015, the Pathologist magazine identified him as the most influential pathologist in the U.S. and third in the world by a vote of his peers. He has been a prolific author writing on topics related to diagnosis of coagulation disorders and optimization of clinical laboratory operations. Major textbooks include Laboratory Medicine, the Diagnosis of Disease in the Clinical Laboratory, published by McGraw-Hill in their prestigious Lang series of medical textbooks. The third edition has been named La Posada's Laboratory Medicine. I will now turn the discussion over to Dr. La Posada for an introduction to today's material. Well, thank you, George. I, I am uh, grateful for the opportunity to tell this story um, about vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And now, uh, if I may share my screen, will you bring the slides up or do I? I think it's this one. Okay, can we see it? Is that a yes, someone? Yes. You can see it. Okay, very good. Um, so um, what, I, um, what I would like to tell you today is that this topic is greatly expanded in scope. When I was invited to give the talk uh, just a couple of months ago, there were a handful of papers about this, maybe 10. And I just, uh, I just uh, went into PubMed this, this day at noontime and wrote uh, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia and 195 papers showed up. So you can see how much more information we're learning about this as we go along. So um, 
I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. And <clears throat> what we're going to do is to talk about the clinical findings first of what we're now going to call VIT for vaccine induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Uh, we're going to say as much as we know about the mechanism for how the platelet count goes down and the clots form, and then talk about the therapeutic guidelines for patients with VIT. So um, a description of the patients who develop thrombosis is where we're going to start. And I want to show you a picture of the vaccines in question. So as you can see, here's one with an American flag on it. It's the J&J &J vaccine. And it says a harmless virus is engineered to contain the gene for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So as we know, um, it's the spike protein that we want antibodies made to to try to prevent us from being seriously ill. And you'll notice there's another vaccine here with two different flags on it, not the United States. And it, it's about the same. It's a little bit different, but it's still got an, uh, uh, an adenovirus uh, vector that is gonna carry um, the spike uh, protein gene. So um, there are two um, uh, different vaccines, both now uh, carried by an adenovirus vector, but you'll notice one is chimpanzee. So the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, is, uh, is a recombinant chimpanzee vector, and it's encoding the spike protein, whereas the J&J &J one is a human adenovirus type 16 vector, I'm not so sure that that has any special meaning, uh, but it is interesting that these problems are associated with uh, virus uh, vaccines that are, um, uh, have the adenovirus vector. So what were the initial observations with these two implicated vaccines? And we'll first start with the Johnson & Johnson one in America. So this is a single case. It was published on May 20th. Uh, the problem started with AstraZeneca, the actual events in late February, and, uh, and by early April, we had the J&J &J issues. So this publication uh, talks about uh, this patient, this single patient with an extensive thrombosis. And at the time in this paper, they said, we already know it looks like autoimmune heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. I'll explain that as we go along. And What's the story of the patient? Well, they had a vaccine two weeks earlier before the symptoms started. Somebody said, hmm, I wonder if this is HIT, heparin is not a good choice. So we'll switch to a anticoagulant because remember it is a thrombotic disorder and switch to an anticoagulant that doesn't resemble heparin to treat the uh, thrombosis. And we'll use intravenous Ig uh, immunoglobulin to uh, raise the platelet count. And it worked, the platelet count arose. But the problem here was that there were neurologic signs that when a head CT was performed, it was not just a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. It was large and larger than you would normally see when you get a spontaneous cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So there was something already special to it. And they started with unfractionated uh, heparin as a treatment, but um, as it turns out, um, it, was, um, it was not very effective. And ultimately, um, uh, it, was, it was a progressive thrombosis and then a hemorrhagic stroke followed uh, as the blood vessel uh, ruptured. And you could see this when you did an imaging study of the brain. And here's a picture, this is normal. Uh, here you see the superior sagittal sinus. Here's, great uh, cerebral vein. And, and so now look where the clot is. So we have very impaired drainage. Remember the blood is coming into the head, but now it has to get out of the head. And we have this big sinus vein thrombosis. So Dr. this is what Dr. we're Dr. this is George. Yes. Um, do you think the problem here was caused by the unfractionated heparin that was being used at this point? Uh, so obviously that was a concern because until we understood VIT, we didn't know if this was it. So there was some reason to be suspicious of heparin, hence the switch to our gatraband. As we are going to learn, uh, and I will tell you, it turns out that you would think with VIT, which is independent of heparin, that it wouldn't matter if you treated with heparin. But in a real world study published in Lancet just very recently, it was shown that our gatraband is a better anticoagulant than heparin. So was it contributory? Probably not. 
Is it a better treatment to use non-heparin anticoagulants? Yes. Okay, so there was a response from the manufacturer who was given the opportunity uh, to uh, present um, their conclusions. And in April 16th, in the New England Journal of Medicine, they said, it's a whole lot of patients. And, uh, and as you probably know, there was a pause in the use of this particular uh, vaccine uh, from the FDA and the CDC. And, uh, and it, was a, it was a wise thing to do, but the reporting rate was less than one in a million vaccinations. Now, what we've learned since there've been 800, 900, uh, 194 publications is that there were a lot of uh, events that were not recognized as being vaccine associated, but the number is still extremely low. And for all the authors of these important papers on all sides, diagnosis, treatment, everything, um, no one is, is uh, supporting a, a, a suggestion that the vaccine not be used. So this is part of the world of vaccinations where there are adverse events and rare ones, and this happens to be one. So this, is, uh, this case illustrated the rare occurrence of this uh, immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia and appears to be related to this adenoviral vector vaccine. So let's go to the next one. And as you can see, this is the AstraZeneca one. And now what we're talking about is a whole lot of people, 82 million vaccines given in the European Union, 21 million outside the European Union, and they have rare cases of vaccine. Now, what happened with this particular case is that the clinical observations fell into the hands of Andreas Greinecker, who works in Germany, and Ted Workington, who have devoted their lives to the productive study of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And this rapid connection was made. So in this series of 11 patients in Germany and Austria who developed thrombosis with a low platelet count in a time frame of within three weeks of the AstraZeneca vaccine, they were more women than men. It looked like it was younger women. If you looked at the days after vaccination, it looks like the days for a fall in a platelet count after HIT. And 10 patients had thrombosis of these 11. One had an intracranial hemorrhage that was probably preceded by a thrombotic event. So as far as we know, every one of these 11 is likely to have had a thrombotic event. We'll see in a moment that the thrombotic event can be extracranial as well. None of these patients got heparin before symptoms came along. They came in for their vaccine. They were not on heparin. So this is a table modified from the paper. And I wanna point out several things. So the top line shows day 10 after the vaccine and day 11 after the vaccine. So this is within the window of the fall in the platelet count in this bit syndrome. And you'll notice the platelet counts, 18,000, 37,000. These platelet counts are not the ones that are less than 3,000. So this also bears a resemblance to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia where there is a moderate decline in platelet count. Now you'll notice the D-dimer is in milligrams per deciliter in the table. A lot of people reported in micrograms per deciliter, which would make 142 be 142,000. It's noted in a number of the papers that the D-dimer is remarkably high, meaning higher than you would expect in a thrombotic event after uh, the development of VIT. You'll also notice in this particular case that the fibrinogen is somewhat low, and you can see the values are somewhat low uh, on the next day. Now, along with the low platelet count, we've got thrombi. And where do we have thrombi? Well, portal vein and splenic and mesenteric veins, this is the splanchnic venous system. We've got uh, DVTs, we've got PEs. So, um, so there are a lot of thrombi. This is the left, right and left iliac arteries and the infrarenal aorta. So now what we're looking at are venous and arterial thrombosis. And that is another clue that this might be heparin-induced thrombocytopenia-like syndrome. 
Um, as you know, with things like factor five Leiden, prothrombin 20210, we're looking mostly at venous problems, but clearly we have arterial and venous. Now, another thing that resembles HIT is that you can have a normal PT and PTT. And as you look at the range, that's quite possible. Here's the D-dimer peak that can go very high. And the fibrinogen is not always low. So there is a picture of maybe a consumptive coagulopathy, but it looks far more like uh, an HIT phenomenon. Now, here are the 11 patients in showing the thrombosis incidence and location. And, um, and what you see are, uh, are that the cerebral vein thrombosis and the splanchnic vein thrombosis are the first two listed. We also have, of course, pulmonary embolism and others. And here are those arterial thromboses, the aortoiliac arteries, big ones. And when you have a big thrombosis, um, arterial or venous, it is often fatal, as it was six times in these 11 patients. Uh, what I did with this uh, map of veins and arteries, which you can't see the names of the arteries, is put a yellow and orange dot wherever the thromboses have occurred. And as you can see, they are literally all over. And they can be arterial and venous. They can be DVTs that become PEs, for example, uh, the splanchnic circulation in here in the abdomen, all sites. So you notice that the thrombosis sites are often atypical. And when you start to get atypical sites for thrombosis, you again believe, begin to think this is something that looks an awful lot like HIT. Now, when I first read this, I remember I was chatting with a friend in Italy, and, and he said, do you think that there's a mechanism to this? And I said, well, to me, it's probably just a coincidence, or maybe it's something in the vaccine product. So let's look at those simple questions first. So let's ask the first one, and that is, is there anything in the vaccine preparation that could have served as an antigen? Maybe it might resemble heparin, like a long chain molecule. So there is a long chain molecule, polysorbate 80. This is in the J&J &J vaccine. But when you look at this, the, the heparin molecule is a sugar, a, a chain of sugar, sugar A, sugar B, sugar A, sugar B. But this is not a polyanion. Also, heparin is negatively charged. So these are long carbon chains. These are just CH2 or methylene. So the long carbon chain is not likely to be something binding uh, to platelet factor four and making it antigenic. And the other uh, uh, piece of evidence here that's important is the Pfizer vaccine, not associated with it, also has a lipid casing and this compound uh, is uh, there as well. So I think it's fair to say that there's nothing in the vaccine preparation that could have served as an antigen that resembled heparin. So here's what I thought it was. I thought it was just a coincidence. After looking at patients with hypercoagulable states for 35 years, the idea that somebody would be sitting on a factor V light and have an acquired risk factor, maybe an anticardiolipin antibody, and then get the vaccine, maybe that tipped the patient over to thrombosis. So there's so many acquired risk factors for thrombosis, surgery, trauma, so like all the patients in the hospital are immobilized, right? They're not on treadmills. Here, malignancy, high estrogen states. So there are lots of people with acquired risk factors. And here are the hereditary risk factors we have to take into account, which if you take them summarily, especially among Caucasians, the factor V Leiden producing activated protein C resistance, the prothrombin mutation, one or two bad genes, and then the heterozygous conditions of CS and anathrombin, uh, which you might find in an adult, were on my mind to say what happened. Uh, this is an actual patient that I have. And I, when they asked me, why did I get a thrombosis? I always draw a picture like this. It says thrombosis risk on the y-axis. And, and, uh, and I told this young woman of 43 that she was born with a factor V Leiden. The factor V Leiden impact on thrombosis was higher than even shown here. When she uh, took on oral contraceptives, she had a major injury to her leg that rearranged her vascular anatomy, but did not get a clot. And then she flew on a long plane ride and got a clot in the airplane. So why don't we just take this and instead of plane ride, put vaccination and maybe I'll use this anticardiolipin antibody in here. So as it turns out, 
if we think about anticardiolipin antibodies, there are papers that show when you get the COVID infection, you get anticardiolipin antibodies. Shouldn't be a surprise. Look, recent infection. But what we don't know is if you get the, the vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, do you get anticardiolipin antibodies? So as far as I can tell from reading this literature, uh, that is an unknown. So I will answer this question and say, could thrombosis be occurring in patients with a hypercoagulable state? Maybe, but it's unlikely. And part of that is, as you're going to see, we have these antibodies to platelet factor four. So there is a way, way better explanation. So as we search for these, for this compelling uh, causation, um, we, we, uh, we turn to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, what I'm going to do in this section is occasionally talk about HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, alone. I'm going to isolate VIT, vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And I'm also going to compare the two. And we're going to get down to what could be the real mechanism by which the platelets get activated and people get thrombosis and platelets are consumed. So as I mentioned before, there are so many similarities, arterial and venous thrombosis, low platelet count, to, to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, the question is, um, how do we explain it when none of these patients saw heparin? So here is the picture of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. These are platelets. Platelets have in their alpha granules a protein called platelet factor four, which binds to and neutralizes heparin. And in this picture, this is a patient who has heparin, and notice the platelet factor four is bound to it. This uh, orange block-like figure is the FC receptor on the platelet. And if the FC receptor is bound by this antibody, it will activate the platelet. So as you can see, for whatever reason we don't know, some people make antibodies that bind to the heparin platelet factor four com complex. Now, most of these antibodies are non-pathogenic. If you have an operation and undergo cardiopulmonary bypass, you make tons of these antibodies, but they don't bind to the surface of the platelet on this FC receptor. So there is a subgroup of these, of these antibodies that are pathogenic by activating platelets. So we have two things that happen. The platelets go down. Why is that? There's an antibody bound to a platelet, which means a splenic macrophage is going to eat it up. And the platelets get activated, so they'll be consumed, they'll aggregate, and boom, you have thrombosis. So that is HIT. Now we're going to make some comparisons as we go forward. Remember, heparin is not a part of this. Now, interestingly, Ted Workington did a very careful view, review of all these cases that could be HIT-like and came up with two types of HIT that don't involve heparin, that has no polyanion exposure. And here's the first one. It, he called it delayed onset HIT, and, HIT, and the heparin is gone. The HIT begins or worsens after the heparin is gone. And this has a short half-life, about an hour. And so it was 12 patients. It was at least five days after heparin was discontinued. And uh, they all had thrombosis, and they had high titer antibodies to the heparin platelet factor four complex. And uh, some had received heparin uh, subcutaneously and others by other ways. But there is another version of HIT, which is even closer to VIT. And that is autoimmune heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And so it can arise after discontinuation or without any preceding heparin exposure. It's called spontaneous HIT syndrome. And clinically, it looks just like HIT. So it doesn't sound like we're on the right track here. We've got something called VIT that doesn't have any heparin. And now we can see that there can be clinical resemblance to HIT because there's even an HIT-like syndrome called spontaneous uh, HIT syndrome. So without proximate heparin exposure to explain the presence of HIT, antibodies. And that was really antibodies to the heparin platelet factor four complex. So let's talk about the clinical and uh, laboratory uh, uh, findings uh, associated with um, 
with uh, some form of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So this is HIT. In HIT, we find thrombi. So let's just take a look. Uh, we have thrombi in the veins. And you'll notice down here, there's not splanchnic. So there's a little bit of differentiation here. The splanchnic thrombosis may be something a little bit more associated with VIT than HIT. And these are arterial thrombotic events. And it's not uncommon to amputate uh, a limb, uh, usually a leg, if there's a, a, an arterial thrombosis. Uh, you can get a stroke. You can get a heart attack. So this is exactly what we're seeing, almost. Um, maybe a little difference in, in sight, but very similar, HIT and VIT. So many different places where the clots can form. I just show you this clot, if you've never seen one of a venous clot, it's actually pulled out at autopsy, starting down by the ankle, bending at the knee. This, if it breaks off and goes to the lung, will create a saddle embolus and uh, instantaneous death. This is an arterial thrombosis, in this case, a, a brachial or radial artery. And as you can see, the gangrenous digits, there's no blood flow. So these are the kinds of clots we're worried about. So hit and bit, similar. This is why we're beginning to think maybe we ought to do tests for HIT to find the VIT. So let's look at the next thing, a moderately low platelet count in the presence of the thrombi. So Ted Workington created this very valuable uh, scoring system called the four T's to determine if somebody has heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And he gave two points, one point, or no points to four characteristics. And two points means it's really supportive of an HIT diagnosis, and no points means it's not very supportive. Well, look at all these. The thrombocytopenia is in the right range for HIT and VIT. The timing of the fall in the platelet count or the thrombosis or the fall in the platelet count with VIT, very similar. VIT has up to three weeks, but it can start around day five. You have the presence of a thrombus and no other apparent cause to explain the findings. So HIT and VIT look like if it's ideal, you score eight on both. So the fall in the platelet count, you're looking at this range, 20 to 150,000. You get really low, it's to start thinking of other causes for thrombocytopenia. Here's a picture that instead of heparin, this would be day one, would be the provision of the vaccine. And if things go along and then boom, the platelet count falls. And what we've learned from the Lancet study, which had a fair number of patients in it, is that switching to our gatroban is better for anticoagulation. And of course, IVIG can help that platelet count rise. So in this study with the 11 patients in Germany and Austria, the timing looks good and heparin was not involved. And the recovery occurs fairly quickly. It may take as long as 25 days, but in this patient that we looked at the, the first patient who got the J&J &J vaccine, the timing is great. The patient was switched to our gatroban, they got IBIG and the platelet count rose. So we're beginning to get a flavor now of what the, uh, what the appropriate and effective treatments are. So let's go to the next thing in this comparison. If you look at the PT-PTT fibrinogen, and I'll add here the D-dimer, um, and the D-dimer is much greater in VIT than it is in other thrombotic disorders by and large. So if you take a look at the German study, you notice that the PT and the PTT could be normal as the fibrinogen. So is this on the borderline of the consumptive coagulopathy? Do we have DIC on top of this? Uh, hard to know, but you can have normal values. And again, similar bit and hit. And now we get to this question about platelet factor four. And do we have a similarity between hit and bit? So um, what I'd like to do here is to um, uh, say a few words about, about the assays that we're talking about that are important in both HIT and VIT. And what I've diagrammed here on the left is an ELISA enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay to pick up an antibody to what I've shown here is the heparin platelet factor four complex. So this is the antibody that the patient has, binds to this, and then there's a second antibody with an enzyme, an uncolored substrate is added to make a colored product and the well will turn to a color if the antibody is present. Now, what, what happened as we learn more about these assays, and this is um, 
shown in a, in a wonderful uh, paper on laboratory testing for uh, VIT uh, by Dr. Favaloro, who's on the call, I see. And, uh, and what we've learned is that there are variations in how this platelet factor four is presented as a target antigen that allow the VIT antibody to be discovered, to be uncovered. Uh, for HIT, there are some rapid assays that people use that will not pick up uh, the antibody uh, to platelet factor four. So there is something special and certain PF4 assays uh, appear to detect uh, the, the, the antibody uh, present in VIT. And, uh, and there's a, there is a complex, which is a polyvinyl sulfonate that when it is linked to PF4 makes PF4 very much able to bind the antibody in VIT. So it is much more promiscuous for the HIT antibody, which appears to bind to a whole bunch of heparin platelet factor four complexes in different assays. And this has something to do with making the diagnosis in all our hospitals. Because if in fact, many of our assays, which we use to detect HIT, do not pick up the antibody in VIT, now we have a challenge. Now, let me say a word about the assay on the right. This assay is called serotonin release. Normal platelets are labeled with radioactive serotonin. That's 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine. Increasing amounts of heparin are added. And as you can see, the heparin here is this, uh, this uh, slightly uh, irregular uh, folded uh, moiety up here. And it is binding uh, to this antibody. And the antibody is binding to platelet factor four. And it binds to the... Uh, to the platelet receptor, the FC gamma receptor, and activates the platelets if it is a pathogenic antibody. So uh, there's a modification of the serotonin release assay where the addition of more PF4, that is right here, will bring out this VIT antibody if it's present. So you see the assays that we have for HIT, both for screening and for activation, a confirmatory assay, are modified to pick up the VIT antibody. Another activation test uh, for HIT is the one used by Reinecker and the group in Germany. And it looks at heparin's ability to induce platelet aggregation. Because remember, the antibody is binding to the platelets, activating them, and then they aggregate. So if you had increasing amounts of heparin, as you can see here, you get more and more aggregation. And when you add a very high dose of heparin, that actually inhibits the aggregation. So this is a classic picture. And they use this uh, with, uh, with uh, platelet factor four enhanced uh, aggregation. So the tests are a little bit different. And as I read them all, I'm beginning to think that the assays in most of our laboratories may miss a VIT antibody and pick up a HIT antibody. Now, let's get down to the question of what is the antigen? So let's look first at HIT. And what we know is this. Here's heparin, sugar A, sugar B, sugar A, sugar B, sulfate groups, very anionic, very negatively charged in long chains, medium-sized chains, or small chains. And here I show you um, uh, this green uh, moiety here is platelet factor four. And what I'm going to do here in my hand is I'm going to give you um, a picture of my fist. And that is the normal platelet factor four. That is the form that the body sees and it doesn't look abnormal. So therefore don't make an antibody to it. But as it turns out, when you put in a glycosaminoglycan like heparin, notice I'm putting in heparin, that's the pen. Now it changes the conformation of platelet factor four. And now this looks immunogenic, it looks foreign. So when you bind this polyanion to the platelet factor four and multiple platelet factor four uh, moieties, it becomes antigenic. So a fragment of heparin first binds within a groove of one PF4 tetramer, and then you start adding on more. We know that if you modify a protein with a drug, it can become immunogenic. So um, it's no surprise. We have lots of biological uh, precedent for a normal human protein becoming antigenic after complexing uh, to glycosaminoglycans. Now, 
This is very interesting. Notice the date for the paper, August 26th. So we're talking about just a few weeks ago. So hit is on the right. Notice heparin, platelet factor four, and a, and a yellow star. And this yellow star represents the small number of amino acids in the protein to which heparin binds. And then we have this antibody that binds the heparin platelet factor four complex and the platelet. Heparin, of course, makes it worse because more heparin, more heparin platelet factor four complexes, more binding, more platelet activation. Now let's compare this to VIT. Now here's the surprising observation. First, there's no heparin. So you would think if there's no heparin, that the antibody that's generated from the vaccination would be binding somewhere on platelet factor four, but not exactly at the epitope where heparin binds. But in fact, that is exactly what happens. So what a coincidence that the antibody without heparin is binding to the same epitope on platelet factor four as heparin binds in HIT. So in this case, if you were to do this assay, heparin actually inhibits platelet activation. It gets in the way of this process. And a PF4 binds platelet activating antibody direct. So we know that. Now here's what we don't know. Um, first, let me show you this. This, uh, this these are the four uh, orange circles of platelet factor four. And you'll notice it binds to one binding site and another it's from the same paper. And this allows this multi uh, uh, antibody complex to form, right? Because uh, this combined a platelet factor for this antibody, and then it combined to that one. And they all complex, and the FC segments uh, of the antibody combine to the FC gamma receptor, and boom, you have platelet activation. So there it is, that's the activation. Now, we don't know why a vaccine makes this antibody. So I think we have to accept the fact that you know, maybe it's 194 more papers that we have to have to understand why the vaccine would do this. Is it something from the adenovirus part or not? And for heaven's sakes, we have no idea why the platelet activating antibodies to PF4 find the same epitope as heparin. Now, just to go back to these assays, res the results of them in the German study, which had 11 patients, they didn't do the test in two of them. But look, Here's the ELISA. They were doing the right ELISA. Everybody's positive. So now it meets all of those criteria for the match of VIT and HIT, even these antibodies to platelet factor four. So here's the platelet factor four dependent platelet activation assay, PF4 enhanced. They did it three times. It was positive for all of them. And the platelets are being activated through the FC receptor. So pretty hard to say this is something that's not awfully like heparin-induced thrombocytopenia with thrombosis. People are treated with different anticoagulants, clearly anticoagulants, as George asked earlier, not implicated. And it's important to know none of them got it before symptoms. Now, here we go with the diagnosis. What do we do? Now, I will say that, um, that there, was a, there was a very important uh, uh, set of recommendations in uh, the paper from Lancet recently published that had to do with diagnosis. And what they did was they grouped diagnosis into definitive VIT, probable VIT, and possible VIT. So what, gee, I mean, just to make it more complicated, right? But we have a few findings, right? The platelet count being low, got to have it. Exposure to a vaccine, that has adenovirus, gotta have it. Thrombosis, gotta have it. Now what? If that's all you got, vaccine and thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, that's called possible VIT. What if you go beyond that? You have all of these and you do an immunoassay screening. And in this case, you have a markedly elevated D-dimer. Notice I didn't say PF4 ELISA a markedly elevated D-dimer, that's probable. Or if you don't have a markedly elevated D-dimer, but you have a positive ELISA, PF4 heparin ELISA, that that will do as well. So there we have the vaccine, thrombocytopenia, thrombosis, and now a markedly elevated D-dimer or ELISA test. That gives you probable VIT.
And if you have uh, definitive bits, uh, you have all of these things and you have a uh, positive on this slide. This is a functional test with some detail. And you notice if you get a negative story here, um, it's, it's not hit, it's not bit. You can use heparin if you want. And likewise, if let's say you had a slightly positive ELISA, but the, uh, but the activation test was negative uh, and you rule out a hit or VIT, then heparin treatment is possible. So as you can see, the definition isn't quite so specific as it looked like it was gonna be. And from the work of the laboratorians who've done the studies on, on the types of assays, um, there is variability that might uh, make it so that somebody has an antibody to hit in a hit assay um, that will not show up if it is induced um, by a vaccine and not heparin. So diagnostic and therapeutic strategies. It's important to recognize this quickly. Uh, IVIG is for the pl platelet count. And I will say direct oral anticoagulant, or if you have an IV, argatroban, of course. And fondaparinux will work as well. You'll notice um, when we have HIT in the the fact that this resembles HIT would make you want to stay away from heparin in the first place. So here we have our gatraban and bivalirudin. Here's Fonda. And, um, and you could use the oral um, uh, inhibitors as well, uh, whether they're anti-10As or anti-2As. And here's the high-dose IVIG. So these don't resemble heparin, so they look okay. Uh, the dose, a gram per kilogram for two days, for the thrombocytopenia. And of course, it depends on which anticoagulant you use as to what dose you, you use. Now, remember, vaccines have adverse events, right? And if you thought VIT, a clot after a vaccine, was the only adverse event to consider, guess what? Here shows up Guillain-Barre. And it showed up after the whole clotting thing. Just to remember that Guillain-Barre is associated with different vaccines. This is a note from the Texas Department of State Health Services in July. And look at this, FDA revised the J&J &J COVID vaccine to include Guillain-Barre. And Guillain-Barre has been found. And so is it one or two? No, but it's really, really, really low. They're about two weeks after vaccination, mostly men age 50 or older. Um, available reports do not show similar patterns of GBS uh, related to mRNA vaccines, and that's 321 million doses. So to summarize all of this important um, information, thrombotic events with thrombocytopenia are very rare in patients who get these vaccines with an adenovirus vector. Certainly no indication to not take the vaccine or worse, to dispose of it in most authors' opinion. And in one of the questions that we're gonna ask in the polling, we'll ask you this very question to see how all of you feel. And the pathogenesis of uh, these antibodies and how they work sure does resemble autoimmune HIT. And if we get it, if we recognize it, more questions for the polling. You do have treatments. You can raise the platelet count. You can anticoagulate. And even with these large thromboses, um, this does not have to be a fatal outcome. So. With that, I will stop sharing and pass this off. Thank you, Dr. Laposada. And um, so we have a moment before they uh, rack up the uh, poll questions. And let me hit you with a couple of things for discussion. We'll have more discussion, of course, after the poll. However, the first thing is, if, if you're looking at this complication of uh, VIT as a significant complication, for the um, J and J or the AstraZeneca, would would you recommend against using those uh, vaccinations in that case? No, I, I I would have no reason to not use the J and J vaccine, for example. And in fact, there there are enough people with vaccine hesitancy that if we can get one shot, one jab to work, that would be the way to go. And the J and J vaccine gives us that opportunity. So I, I think this is a really important vaccine to keep on the lens. Very good. And how would you um, inform the public without raising concerns about the vaccine? Uh, how would you discuss this with the public and say, 
what are the risks and what are the rewards? Yeah, so this is a really tough question, isn't it, George? Because, of course, we'd like the public to participate in their health care. That's one of the key things about the report on diagnostic errors from the National Academy. The trouble is that I think that we in healthcare can often digest the fact, understand that it's rare, and proceed with an understanding of adverse events. I think that left to the general populace, it may take on a different uh, connotation. And so I guess what I really hope is that mm -hmm. the doctors of patients would inform their own patients that they are comfortable with this level of very low risk and move forward. So I think there has to be some counseling. Patients always need to know, but I hope that we're informing practitioners about this story in a way that they can inform their patients. Thank you. And while we're waiting to start the poll questions, uh, this is a question to you from Mandy O'Leary. Mandy, and hello. She's asking, how are things in Galveston after Nicholas this morning? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you that uh, a lot of the island lost power. So uh, my biggest worry waking up this morning was that um, I couldn't get the internet to work and I'd have to go to some other place in Texas, but no, I'm sitting at my office. Thank you. I'm just going to tell you right now that the questions are all opinion. So if you're worried about this being a test with the right answer, don't worry. Here comes the first one. So this is a diagnosis that looks maybe more complicated than we thought. So the question is, in what percentage of occurrences do you think a diagnosis of VIT is likely to be made to prevent major complications? So it's one thing to show up at the emergency room. So the question is, almost nobody, 0 to 10 percent. 10 to 50% now with all these people educated about this, right? Um, but is it getting to the public enough that 75 to 95% would go? So it's thrilling to see the answers here. So yes, please vote. Um, so I, I think that the, it's interesting as we see the votes coming in. Well, I hesitate to do this here. Picking the votes too soon, you never know. Pennsylvania will roll in here, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but in any case, um, the extremes are rare, right? Although zero to 10 is picking up steam. But it's pretty clear that most people think um, that most people think that, um, that uh, it's gonna be less than half the folks. So um, if you go to an academic medical center, these kinds of rounds are common people tune into webinars, you'll probably have an advantage uh, for something like this. So I, I think we have a clear answer to number one, less than 50% for sure. Let's go to number two. So, okay, tough enough to get the diagnosis. Do you think that people know to give IVIG for the platelet count and to use an anticoagulant, not heparin in this case, uh, to treat the complication of thrombosis? So what percentage are going to get the right treatment, even as, assuming that all the patients come in and you get a diagnosis? So this is just the people who get a diagnosis. Once you get that, this is very interesting. See? Love the poll. So when you get the diagnosis, a lot of doctors, I, I'm commenting on 50 to 75%, which is really gaining steam. So if you have a lot of doctors who say, well, I have a clot, they're going to pick an anticoagulant. Now they might pick heparin, but they also might pick something else because we're using a lot of different anticoagulants. So it's a possibility for that. And when they see the low platelet count, they might think that IVIG is an option, even if they don't have a concept of VIT. So this is a thoughtful audience. Um, I think everybody was listening and thinking at the same time. Um, I absolutely agree. I, I think that it's somewhere in, the, I don't know, let's call it 40 to 60 or 70 percent range. But let's go on to the next question. Okay, so now you get to the point where you say, I've got a patient who had a vaccine. I asked a question and they have a thrombosis and they have a low platelet count. And now somebody says, hey, does the lab have a hit test? And in this case, most labs will have a ELISA hit test. 
and maybe it won't be the best. Uh, maybe it won't pick up the bit test, but it's all we got right now. Um, and so how many are gonna get the, the test for HIT? Wow, there's a, this is a clear, clear uh, choice for 10 to 50%. I, I personally think that's, that's very fair. Um, some, you know, you do, most doctors don't work in isolation. And if you have an emergency room full of 10 doctors, one says, you know what? This could be that thing about the clots after the vaccine. What test was that we were supposed to? And then they call a lab and they say, oh, you want to hit ELISA test. And then boom. So I, if I had to guess how it will play out in real life, I would say that. And I totally agree 10 to 50%. Let's go to question four. So, boy, well, here it is, folks. Here's your personal opinion, and I'm dying to see it. Should we, based upon all of what you heard about clots being associated with adenoviral associated vaccines, should we throw it all in the ocean? Should we use it up and then say, we're not making any more of that stuff? Or should we just do what we've been doing? It's a single jab. Boy, if Tony Fauci were watching, he would be so happy. Right. I mean, here's a whole audience of in all these different places that are going to say, OK, we agree. We agree. I mean, I th that's fantastic. I, I, there are still seven in pink who would rather probably, I suspect, go with mRNA vaccines. They got their own issues. I will say that mRNA vaccines, just like the infection of COVID, have been associated with myocarditis. Now, it's really, really, really rare. But the question is, what about the myocarditis of the mRNA vaccine? Is there a perfect one? I don't know. So um, uh, anyhow, uh, it's clear that the dominant opinion, and I, I, it would be an interesting conversation if I could uh, have a separate talk just to find out what the people are thinking, the two folks who say throw it all away, and that's okay. Everybody's entitled to an opinion. And there must be a really, really good reason, which is why I'd really like to know. And there's one more question. Do you think the platelet factor four has anything to do with this? Do you believe the evidence is strong enough that this is antibodies to platelet factor four that's leading to platelet activation and thrombosis? Uh, yes or no? So mechanistically, it's always hard to know for sure, but. I, I think that uh, the fact that the antibody binds to platelet factor four in the same epitope, you know, a cluster of five or 10 amino acids, and the antibody would bind to those five or 10 amino acids in platelet factor four, just where heparin binds. Um, so someday there will be a figure in a prominent journal that explains the whole thing, just like we learned about things like thrombotic, thrombocytic, phenic purpurin. We wondered what, how did that happen? And how did that go on for all those years? And then we get a mechanism in two adjacent papers in the New England Journal. So um, clearly the predominant opinion is that. I think I've gone through the five poll questions. Are there any other questions, George? That You better believe ask? it. <laughs> There's okay. a lot of questions. So okay. we'll go through some of these. I'll tell people if we don't get to them all, uh, Dr. Lapsad and I will work on answering them afterwards and get them back to you. Sure. And the sure. first one is from uh, Dr. Long Jing, University of Kansas. And as you know, of course, the first word in the question has to do with Adam TS13. Do Adam <laughs> TS13 and von Willebrand factor play a role in pathogenesis of VIT because of potential cytokine release after immunization? Cytokines are known to trigger and low band factor release would inhibit Adam's TS-13 synthesis. Wow. <laughs> so uh, in, the, in the 194 papers, looking at the titles, I don't know that there was one that addressed that question. But you know, all of these diagrams start out with two or three events. Then they realize that's connected to that. Oh my goodness. And that's connected to that. So what I'm saying is I wouldn't rule that out at all. I just like to see if there's any evidence for it. It's not. It's not um, irrational at all. Good, thank you. We'll move on. This is from Olina uh, Rodnieva, 
And it says, um, are there any reports of the same events with other types of vaccines, such as the RNA-based vaccines? So the, for the clotting issue, it really looks specific for the adenoviral vaccines. As I pointed out, other adverse events can occur with the different vaccines, like myocarditis in the, in the mRNA vaccines. And it was, um, I would say it was a surprising thing to see that uh, patients um, might suffer all these different adverse effects. Mm -hmm. Think about Guillain-Barre with vaccines that don't have anything to do with, um, with SARS-CoV-2, where you can get a vaccine and then end up with uh, the neurologic issues associated with Guillain-Barre. So, you know, when we think about the number of pathogens in the hundreds of thousands, I'm here at UTMB, we have the Galveston National Lab with biosafety level four, and they study all the terrible infectious agents in the world. And I asking people who are virologists, you know, just how many viruses are there? Hundreds of thousands, right? So, so I think that as we develop vaccines, we're going to find out that there are adverse events and it would be great to get the mechanism, right? Because then we could design the vaccine to limit the adverse events. And of course, we have adverse events with this virus that are uh, the vaccine, um, and people are more worried about it now with the third shot. I had my third shot of Pfizer. Uh, you know, will you get headache, chills, fever, all those other kinds of the mild things that go away. That Those are the things that we worry about, but not nearly as much as these events, which can be costly to life. I would add that I know of at least one individual who suffers Guillain-Barre after the COVID infection, not the vaccine. Whoa. But, yeah. So that is a possibility. Here's a, a good one from Kathleen Finnegan. If you have CITP, chronic immune thrombocytopenic purpura, should you get the vaccine? And if yes, which would be the better? <laughs> so <laughs> I, um, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen it, but I, I, may I recommend this one paper? Um, it was a short paper. It was written by two platelet guys who are my friends, Doug Scenes and Jim Bucell. And what they did was they used a whole paragraph and said, these are all the things we don't know. And there's another paper written by Tom Wartell, which is what we know and what we don't know. These questions are what we don't know. <laughs> so I'd be curious to know if and, and somebody must have an anecdote of somebody who maybe has a history of, uh, of ITP. Uh, maybe they're not uh, suffering from thrombocytopenia right now, who got the, the vaccine. That would be, I'll, I'll bet you those data are there, they're just not written. And if you, if you find that, would you send it to maybe this group and they'll forward it to me? I'd like to learn everything I can. That's a very good question in a lot of people's heads. Yeah, thanks for that one, Kathleen. We'll do a little work on that, see what we come up with. Yeah. And um, this is from uh, your fellow Texan, David McGlasson. Hi, David. And this goes at the, uh, the laboratory testing, which I know we could talk about for a long time. Uh, what lab tests can you be using to provide an accurate and timely diagnosis of VIT? And I'm going to add to his question, how good is it to uh, require the platelet factor for antibody tests? Yes. So I think that um, this is a supremely good question. And Really, it was the, the, not only the paper by Dr. Favaloro, but also the New England Journal paper uh, from a group in France, first author of Bain, B-A-Y-N-E. And, and they looked at three different groups of the, um, of the assays, which we use for HIT, in which platelet factor four is, um, is, uh, is linked um, <clears throat> in one way or another to heparin, uh, there's another one where it's platelet factor four that's released from a platelet lysate, and then that's complex with heparin. It's another group of assays. And then another one, which has this polyvinyl sulfonate complex with, with a platelet factor four. And really, that group of assays beats the other two. That said, they work some, the others. So what would happen is if you came to our place, Dave, and we did the, 
and we did the uh, assay, you would get our HIT assay. Um, and it's an HIT assay that could make you positive, but the OD would be less than it would be for the one with this particular linkage. I don't think that, that we have labs across the world um, that are using the polyvinyl sulfonate linked PF4 uh, that often. So, um, so I think we're stuck with what we have. If we get a positive, then great. Now we're really convinced you have VIT. But uh, if, if you have possible VIT as opposed to probable VIT, you're still getting an anticoagulant and an IVIG if I'm taking care of you. Yeah, it really looks like in these cases, if there's any hint of it, you would switch off the heparin and switch on to Argatraban or one of the other choices. Yes. Yeah. Okay, going on quickly, um, any assay directly targeting at the FC receptor that is in development? Whoa, so I don't know. Ones, yeah. That's a, wow. I wonder, I wonder if anybody on the call knows, but you know, it is a little odd, right? That you, you get antibodies to the heparin platelet factor four complex after cardiopulmonary bypass and they do nothing. They just confuse you. You don't know if it's gonna be thrombotic or not. So, um, so what is it that makes an antibody want to bind to the FC receptor if it binds to the heparin platelet factor four and then activate the complex? And I, I think even though we're learning a lot about the, bi the biochemistry of of the uh, FC gamma receptor, um, I, don't, I don't think the answer to that is no. Good, thank you. Um, if anybody wants to write a research grant, take all these questions that are unknowns and make these your specific games. They're great questions. They are good, yeah. Uh, Mandy O'Leary wants to know, could you change the HIT assay to be more sensitive to find VIT in those areas that have high COVID incidence. Boy, that would be a good thing, right? Yeah. Um, I, I will say after I've been reading the papers, um, I would like to think about how we in our COAG lab could develop um, an assay similar to our HIT assay, but one that is more likely to pick up the VIT antibody with a high optical density. And if we could do that, then the lab would say, oh, this is for VIT, and put it on that assay, that platform. We'd have to create it. Great. Oh, these are good ones. Here's another one for you. This is from Dr. Deb Josco up in New Jersey. Did all the individuals that had a thrombotic event after the vaccine have thrombocytopenia prior to the vaccine? In other words, if you have a normal platelet count and got the vaccine, is there a chance to develop a thrombosis? Wow. Yeah. So you, I, so I'm gonna just be a doctor here for a minute, right? So if somebody, I'll pick your, I think your prototype patient, you don't know you have immune thrombocytopenia purple. You're rolling around 50,000 platelets. And then you get the J&J &J vaccine. And for some reason, you get stimulated to have this antibody. So the question is, are you as likely to develop thrombosis if your platelet counts 50,000 or 200,000, completely normal? So me as a doctor thinks if you get thrombi, they're gonna be micro thrombi. I mean, I think your platelets can still get activated. The reason I'm suspecting there'd still be a thrombus is because if you look at HIT, what do you see? you see a low platelet count and you see thrombosis. And if you were thinking about it, low platelet count matches bleeding. But in this case, when you have activated platelets, you can have a platelet count that is low, but still lets you have thrombosis. If you were down at 3000 platelets per microliter, you'd probably have signs of you know, bleeding or bruising, petechiae. But if you had a platelet count that was asymptomatic, but low, I think you could still develop thrombi, but I'll bet they'd be smaller. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to skip past one for a moment. Um, Dr. Renee Hodgkins is asking, this is to go along with Dr. Jing's question, did you come across any studies looking at the blood type and incidence of VIT? Wow, 
So no, I didn't. Now you got to figure that the numbers are small. So, hmm. So what do I get? I get 11 patients in Germany and Austria who really didn't make a thing of it. So the statistical significance would be hard to show if there were a blood type reference because the numbers are so small. So it could be that if they did O versus non-O, which is often how groups that they might see a difference. Um, so that's one possibility. Uh, the bigger group, um, where they talked about the different definitions in the Lancet paper, had more patients, and they invited people who had um, who had VIT cases so that they could make a paper with lots of patients. And um, and I have, as I have all the papers uh, sitting here, I'm um, I'm now going to go back and see if I can find in that uh, Lancet paper if they had anything to do with blood type. I will say, having read the paper and trying to put the, the information from the paper into my head, they didn't focus on a blood type. And would I suspect one? And if, if you're right, it would relate to Long's question, right? Because mm -hmm. if it were blood type and Von Willebrand's was somehow in this picture, that would matter. So they might be linked. I'm gonna do two more questions. There's a couple here we won't be able to get to. And the first one is, this is, um, it's at the mechanism. And this is from S. Bergbauer. Okay. A 2020 paper by Chatham et al. nicely summarizes how complement coagulation and inflammation pathways all lead to thrombi in COVID patients. I don't know how to explain the PF4 antibodies, but given that a vaccine encodes the spike protein, is it possible that the spike is also capable of binding the ACE2 receptor and prompting the same process, potentially causing those thrombotic events in vaccinated individuals? I love that question. Let me, let me just say this, but before we had this clotting event, being interested in this field, right? What, what, what was it that everybody asked about? And it was, what, why are we getting thrombi in the lung in patients with the infection? Not the vaccine, the infection. And it begs the question whether there's a linkage between injecting a part of this virus, just the spike protein, um, and in some patients getting a thrombotic event and having a natural infection where there's tons of spike protein and you get all these thrombi in your lung. Um, nobody's worked out the mechanism to that detail, but boy, if this was something I could sniff, I'd say there is a connection. Interesting. One more, and then uh, for those of you who don't get your questions answered, don't worry, we'll come back to you um, afterwards, and it might be a day or two before we get them answered. And this is from Blair Logan. Is there any research about patients that have had COVID already, who then get the vaccine about having less likelihood of adverse events, or is it unknown? Well, how about that? Let me, let me just say this. I read a very important paper about having the infection and then having the vaccine. I'm gonna go like this. This is how much antibody that you have when you get infected. When you get the vaccine, you have this much antibody. But it turns out that when you get the vaccine and you've been infected, you have another some 50 to 100% more antibody. So if you've been infected and then you get a vaccine, the amount of antibody, presumably neutralizing antibody, increases. Now, how that all fits in with this picture of thrombosis, I think is hard to say. But, um, but clearly there is a biology for the patient, for the people who've been infected and then later got vaccinated. And, um, and I, I, I don't know the answer, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's in the literature either. I think it's one we're gonna have to wait for. I'll amplify that just a little bit. And that is um, our mutual friend and someone who many people here know is Gordon Enns, who runs the uh, Inflammatory Markers Laboratory in Wichita. He's testing for antibodies and showing exactly what you just illustrated 
and that is antibody levels following the COVID infection, antibody levels uh, following the first and second injection as well. He would be on with us tonight, but he's actually presenting his material on uh, Wichita local television as we speak. So um, we'll be watching for that. Thanks everybody for your questions. We'll get to the questions that we haven't done uh, afterwards. And at this time, I wanna thank everybody for your participation and turn it back over to Rose. Thank you. And I wanna thank Mr. Fritzma and Dr. Laposada for that fabulous dialogue exploring the association between SARS-CoV-2 viral vector vaccines and thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. It's great to see the participation in the polls and the number of questions that were asked that really illustrate the interest in this topic. This webinar was supported by an educational grant from Biomedica Diagnostics Inc, a member of the Scotia Investments family of companies. And note that Biomedica Diagnostics Inc is approved as a provider of continuing education in the clinical laboratory sciences by the ASCLS PACE program. On behalf of the sponsor and our speakers, thank you for attending this important event and good night. <laughs>